Excellent. Can I welcome you all to the Scrutiny Programme Committee? Um, we have a very full agenda, so we'll plough on as quickly as we can. First of all, apologies for absence. I've got Sherry Bija, who's the PSB Scrutiny Corruptee, and Councillor Will Thomas, and also Sean Harrop Griffiths, who's the Director of Strategy Swansea Bay University Health Board, had planned to attend, but is unable to do so and has sent her apologies as well. Do we have anybody else, uh, Bridge? Or Chair, and Clive Lloyd as well, sorry. Oh, and Clive Lloyd as well. OK. Right, OK. Disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest. Anybody want to declare? Yeah, can everyone have their, their microphones on mute? It sounds like someone's in the middle of a wind a, a, a hurricane there. Any Anybody want to declare any declarations of interest? No? OK. Oh, hang yeah, on. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Yeah, Sam. Some hand. But, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, can I declare a, a, a personal and prejudicial interest in item agenda seven? You can indeed, yes. Uh, okay. Just relating back to when uh, I was a cabinet member. Okay, and uh, they'll send you a form to fill in in due course, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, prohibition of whip votes in declaration of party whips. And then on to minutes. So minutes of the last meeting for to information and to prove um, page one, page two, page three, page four, and page five. Can we agree those on accurate minutes, please? I think I will take silence as assent. So thank you very much for that. We shall then move on to item five, which is public question time. I believe we haven't had any qu any public questions received at all, Bridge. That, that's correct, yeah. Okay. So item six then scrutiny of Swansea Public Services Board. Um I believe we have the leader, Councillor Rob Stewart here. Um and Andrea Lewis, Councillor Andrea Lewis, is she here as well? Yes, I am, Chair. Excellent. And we have Keith Reed, the Executive Director of Public Health from the, the Health Board as well. Um Adam Hill is here. Uh, Jane Whitmore and Julie Gosney. Um, Jane is the Strategic Lead Commissioner and Julie Gosney Partnership and Involvement Team Manager and of course Adam is Deputy Chief Executive. Excellent. Um, Rob or somebody else, does somebody want to just very briefly introduce us to the, this item or make a few, yeah. say a few words in advance? If or I Andrea? could say a few words, Chair, that would be Andrea. really welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so obviously, um, you know, the main focus of the committee today is our PSB annual report, uh, mm -hmm. and more specifically, early years and the live well, age well, PSB wellbeing objectives. Uh, as you've said, we've got Keith with us from the Health Board this afternoon, who I understand is going to give a, a short presentation. And I would also like to invite Adam Hill, our, our Deputy Chief Executive, to give some comments. But firstly, just a brief introduction from myself as Chair of the Swansea Public uh, Service Health Board, uh, Service Board, sorry. Uh, the Joint Committee has been working on improving our baseline data, developing a new wellbeing assessment and a framework that will support the reporting of performance through the new plan. A performance framework is to be discussed at our next meeting um, on the 7th of April uh, 2022. Uh, back on the 17th of June last year, a discussion paper was presented to the Joint Committee which set out an improved model for delivering and measuring success. And the Joint Committee has also agreed a scoping matrix to ensure projects and objectives and work streams are clear in what the unique contribution from the PSB is and whether the work requires advocacy, intervention, monitoring or delegation to a different group. So I'm going to hand over to Keith uh, for a brief presentation uh, and invite Adam in to give some comments. Thank you, Chair. OK, Keith, um, can I, we, we have very limited time, Keith. So if you're able to keep this to five to ten minutes, be much appreciated. I'm sorry, I think there's been a misunderstanding, Chair. I, I don't have a presentation. Oh. I was told that, that we could rely on what was in the annual report. Right, so that's fine. OK, I'm sorry. do you want to say a few words about the annual report before we move on? Before we go to questions? No, I, I think I think the annual report stands for, it stands for itself. It's it's in the okay. public domain. It's been widely circulated. And I, I guess the only thing I would say is that the past year has been dominated by the COVID response. So you know, the, that that's the lens through which um, which my responses will be uh, focused. 
Um, so just to, to bear that in mind, uh, yeah. I, I think the annual report does, you know, does bring that into relief. So uh, that, that would be the, the only comments I would make in the preamble. OK, thanks for that, Keith. Uh, Adam, you want to say a few words as well? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll keep it very brief because you have got a lot on the agenda. So it was just ready to say that obviously the, the report can give a good overview, uh, as Keith has already alluded to, in terms of most of the information in there. But it'd be remiss of me not just to point out the, the substantial amount of work that has been undertaken um, by the various teams uh, across the Live Well, Age Well group uh, and also across the early years. Um, looking at things like the children's rights scheme, uh, again, looking at uh, 14 secondary schools, 79 primary schools and two special call schools have been involved in, in those schemes in terms of the refresh scheme, the launch packs, uh, and they were all distributed across, uh, across a number of schools. 43 organisations and individuals are, are working with children and young people as part of the children's rights network. Um, working again in, in partnership to make Swansea an age-friendly city uh, and again working across um, the Older People's uh, Commissioner, Welsh Government, age-friendly cities, communities and working um, within our own local authority with partners. Uh, a lot of work has been undertaken to uh, develop the Age Well Steering Group um, established back in July 21. Um, this has uh, currently 42 uh, Aging Well Steering Group members and champions that work across that steering group uh, and currently two working groups focused on uh, shared data to inform strategy and improving information and communication. Uh, I think it's also important to note that, that um, across all, all both work streams it's, it's listening to the voice of people living in Swansea uh, in both early years and in terms of uh, Live Well Age Well um, we've managed to recruit a, a dedicated partnership and involvement officer um, who uh, has the remit for uh, children, young people, families, but also focusing on partnership and involvement with work uh, of people 50 uh, plus uh, across Swansea. Um, two separate formal consultations have, have been undertaken. I, I won't go into more detail other than to say that listening to children and young people and listening to people 50 plus. So engaging as much as possible with those two areas uh, of population to ensure that that voice is heard and true engagement is undertaken. Um, on top of that, uh, we have safeguarding and equality in the LGBTQ plus areas. 26 young people from Swansea have been working in partnership with young people. Uh, also from Neath Port Talbot to develop a resource pack for schools um, and on top of that work has commenced uh, on um, to recruit votes at 16 ambassadors uh, again for each secondary school to champion registration to vote and young people's democracy so again looking at how we can get people engaged both young and old in all the the, uh, the elements that we we take part in um, Lots of other events that I'd, I'd happily, I can either circulate later uh, as a briefing note, Chair, if you, you'd like me to, on the other uh, community feedback engagement and um, events that have been taking place over the last year. As Keith says, uh, a number of these have been affected, as you can imagine, by COVID. So uh, the level of work that we would have wanted to undertake has not been possible. And as we started to uh, undertake more activities, things like weekly and chat which had to over 225 participants uh, weekly marina walks 140 participants the, these have not been able to happen right the way through the year as we'd like to but I think that does reflect one COVID but also that where we could gain uh, traction in, in, in returning back to some normality we've done so where it was safe uh, and, uh, and we're able to do so under COVID regulations. I'll, I'll Pause there, Chair, because I know there are a number of questions that, that you'd want to raise, um, but I thought that was useful just to give a context of, of some of the work that's been undertaken in the two work streams. Thank you for that, Adam. OK, so we'll move on to questions then. I've got a first question from Peter Jones, Councillor Peter Jones. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm afraid it's a rather perennial question that I seem to ask on virtually every occasion that we address uh, the work of the PSB. And I say that 
as someone who was previously engaged back in 2014, early 2015, in the drafting of the PSB wording in the Wellbeing Act. So uh, I was sceptical then. I'm afraid I remain sceptical now. Um, and my question uh, in this committee has called upon the PSB to improve its performance framework to better evidence the tangible difference that it is making and also improve the clarity of action and outcome from meetings. The committee would welcome any statement around action taken or planned to address this. And for example, to what extent are the achievements being reported on, say in relation to uh, the working with nature theme, things that were likely to have been achieved uh, without the structure of the PSB. In other words, I'm saying my, my contention is uh, that much of what is being done, certainly in the area of concern to me, working with nature, would have happened in any in any case, particularly in relation to ZRW. Uh, but that's my question, Chair. Thank you. OK, I think Andrea is volunteering to answer that question. Well, actually, I'm going to ask Adam to come in on the okay. question. But what I wanted to do, Chair, is to um, highlight, it was remiss of me not to thank all the teams involved uh, in the PSB. There's an incredible amount of work going on. And also to thank Adam, particularly around this item, because I know Adam's done a lot of work on this. So hence why I'm inviting Adam in to give the response, because he's he's done a lot of the master planning behind this. OK, Adam. Thank you, Chair. And th thanks for the question, Peter. Um, yeah, so in terms of the performance framework, you, you'll remember that uh, I've now presented a couple of scrutinies with regard to this. Um, what we've been utilising because of COVID over the uh, over the last year, we've managed to have a good opportunity to improve our baseline data um, under the new wellbeing assessment that you know is being formulated currently and will be ready uh, in the early part of, of this current year. Um, we've developed a framework that will support the reporting of performance moving forward. So um, a discussion paper was presented to the Joint Committee um, last year, uh, which set out uh, an improved model for delivering and measuring success. Um, we've also, uh, as a PSB board, agreed a scoping matrix to ensure projects, objectives and work streams are clear in what unique contribution the PSB will bring uh, to that project and whether that requires advocacy, intervention, monitoring or delegation. So it's a two by two matrix, quite straightforward, uh, and it will show what the, uh, the project work is, whether or not the PSB will just need to support it uh, to ensure its success, whether it needs more intervention or finance and what the outcomes or whether that needs to be delegated through to one of the other groups, such as working with Nature, Peter, that you've identified, because we, we must remember that the board is to sit under the governance aspect of it and the work streams are there to deliver uh, such as uh, working with nature and they should signpost back when there is a problem but we want the work streams to deliver on those agendas uh, that are in place. So in terms of success criteria what we've looked at within the performance framework is delivery and measuring success. So these will include both hard and softer um, key performance indicators so the, the hard ones are, are looking at more things like funding resources, uh, tangible uh, numbers that, that we can record, you know, attendance and how many came through and so on. The softer ones will be the qualitative type, such as distance traveled outcome, uh, what was the uh, feeling, um, the enjoyment level and, and so on. So that, that will include all aspects of things like social media, poll shares, likes, comments. It will have um, what the agreed outcomes are and, and milestones that will be uh, reached across that. Bottom up involvement of wide cross section of groups. So what number of groups, how many individual participants, supporters, unique um, um, unique votes or inter interactions that have taken place. Um, there will be a perception progress tracker also about how partners feel the PSB has impacted uh, maybe via lens of the five weights of working or smiley faces or or so on, because we, we need to make sure that we've got both aspects of what's happening, because not everything can be a tangible measure. Some of it is, is about that uh, that enjoyment factor, which which we mustn't lose sight of. Um, then there's active participation uh, and how it impacted on individuals. 
uh, and then that will be brought about under linking directly with the new plan for 22-23 because of course we're, we're looking at the new well-being assessment it would be wrong to bring something in on the old uh, model we, we need to align it all so that the framework marries with where we need to go in the future with the new well-being assessment and plan so just in terms of a few of the achievements um, which it, it's, it's a little always a little disappointing when uh, when you know you hear that, that people are saying that they don't feel that the PSB has been a success in its own right when when you look at the annual report and see all the very you know positive actions that have been taken you read the minutes from the report that is is a loads of agreed actions and outcomes that have been achieved um, so so it is a little disappointing but let, let me just tell you some of the things that that we've been involved in so um, that wouldn't have happened without the PSB inter interaction so the commitment to a human rights city for example uh, and the commitment that we've got in in order to um, put our uh, flag in the ground to say that we will be a human rights city that has sign up and commitment from all partners on the joint committee of the PSB which gives a weight to it for all of them to come together as a, as a council we can't do it on our own but the PSB have championed this in order to deliver it again a culture of community the mental health agenda and uh, looking at that focus for a city for well-being and wildlife and the support that the PSB has given to the climate emergency and the nature emergency again have all come through now some of that may well have happened but not as a public service board with all partners signing up uh, and making that commitment to make a difference together which I think is a, is a big win uh, in terms of um, the state of natural resources report the sonar report that was presented to the PSB by Natural Resources Wales and it's been agreed that the four aims included of that will form part of the future direction of the PSB so the PSB again can add weight to the partners uh, reports in terms of how we manage those resources going forward again for me that's an absolute huge win in terms of the the strength of the PSB partnership coming together and driving <clears throat> the agendas of of the partners uh, in areas that perhaps uh, certain aspects wouldn't wouldn't engage with the work that's been undertaken in the community safety partnership in terms of turning around the high street from where it was to a much improved area again has been championed by the PSB making sure resources are there bidding for funding and supporting funding bids that has seen the development of the Defati regeneration area uh, the unit the three empty units the development of a community social enterprise cafe meeting space with the third sector all of which has happened because the PSB has got behind this and championed it uh, as a collective for all partners. Uh, the final bit that I'd just like to um, say is also about the strengthening relationships across public sector, which what we have seen is the great working relationship that has come because of the relationships that have been formed from the PSB in responding to the COVID emergency. And again, had the PSB not been in and those networks and those friendships and, and colleagues not worked together in that way, we wouldn't have had the same level of commitment and enterprise that we had working with people like the university on making face masks, on working together with the health board to solve adult social care tensions, or how we create a new TTP team from scratch within a matter of weeks all because we were able to utilize those networks and, um, and relationships that were already in place and the final one is is some funding that came from nrw supporting um, areas of work such as the fire breaks uh, the nature recreation and action project swansea environmental forum which got funding from there um, of 8k and working with nature task group some of that may well have happened, but without that funding, which was channeled through the PSB to ensure that the money was spent in the right area, means that the return on investment can be maximized, looking at all agencies working together to get more value for a the, the amount of money that, that was put forward. Um, I, I am minded that, that this is really about uh, live well, age well and early years, but I hope that that does. I have tried to, to focus in a little bit, Peter, in terms of your question uh, in relation to the environmental side. Uh, but but tonight is not really about that. It, it's about live well, age well and early years. But I hope, Chair, that you didn't mind me just straying into that as the question did ask.
Oh, you don't do it too often, Adam. <laughs> OK, uh, Peter, are you OK with that? We've got a further question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Adam, for your very detailed and comprehensive response. I hear where you're coming from, so to speak. I think my opinion obviously is very much biased by my focus on the environmental area, uh, where I can only say from my own experience, and I am a member of the Working with Nature task group that helped to develop their contribution, that I've not been uh, in, impressed by the added value of what we were doing. I'm fairly convinced that most, if not all, would have happened anyway. Um, but it's been a very, I mean, I, I'd congratulate you on the, the written report. It's very detailed, very comprehensive. I read it with interest and care. Um, uh, I, I remain to be convinced, but thank you anyway. Thank you. Okay. Andrew, you want to add to this? Yes, please. If I can just add something um, briefly. Um, actually, uh, Peter might uh, well be aware that the climate change charter, the climate and nature emergency charter that we um, drafted as a council, uh, which of course we signed up to and Cabinet signed up to, uh, we actually took to the Public Service Board and I'm pleased to say all our partners signed up to that commitment. And in addition to that, we will be looking in future meetings at any overlap and any collaboration that we can do in terms of climate and nature. Uh, for example, we all will be looking to green our fleets, um, you know, the, the health service with their ambulances, the fire service, um, the council, etc. So we're looking at opportunities where we can share good practice, but also maybe even share EV charging infrastructure uh, and looking at how we can move things forward together as partners. Um, I appreciate that might not involve every single partner every single time, but wherever we can, we'll be working closely together to achieve the goals and to bring Swansea and the region towards net zero by 2030 uh, and uh, across or, uh, further than the organisations engaging with the public uh, collaboratively to reach 2050. OK, uh, Lee, do you want to come in as well? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I know I'm primarily here for the for the next item, but just to um, uh, you know, respond to to what's been said, I think uh, Peter's challenge is is the right one, which is you know I'm I'm very much of the opinion that we we don't um, go into meetings that have no real purpose and make no real impact, and uh, and that and that is a continual challenge. I think we should throw out. But what I would say uh, to Peter is, of course. I think what he got was the benefit of the existing relationships we'd built over a number of years since perhaps 2012, 2014 with a number of partners and the fact that the PSB had been in place for some time and had been operating and those relationships were already working pretty well, that that, that also helped, uh, you know, direct engagement that, that I think Peter's referenced to. So I think certainly over my time as a councillor, I've seen the collaboration between uh, different agencies and organisations improve markedly. And I think, I don't think we'd have got, you know, I know Keith's here today, but I don't think we'd have got to the point where we've got shared posts between health and, and the council had we not have had the basis of the PSB arrangements to build upon. So I, I do take Peter's challenge and I think it's the right one, which is we should always make sure that, uh, you know, arrangements that we have are adding value. But I think certainly from my experience, the fact that we've worked together in the PSB and other uh, environments over a number of years now has helped create that really good uh, cooperative working relationship and strong relationships between different organisations. OK, thank you. Right, next question, um, Chris Holly. He is here. No, just... Oh. Councillor Terry Herrigan has got his hand up. Yeah, but I'm working through the questions from the pre-meeting first. So, but Chris Holly, are you there, Chris? Yeah, I just was on mute, I'm sorry. Um, the PSB in its very forms has been around many, many years and we've had numerous reports and going back to 2002 and, you know, so 20 years of <clears throat> in some form or other a PSB. Problem that has been the public visibility of what they do. It was interesting here that um, what Adam just said about the units at the top of High Street that the uh, PSB are uh, champion them. Well, I, I'm not sure if anybody knows that. Uh, and and that's part going back to what Peter said is what does how do the public and how do members 
know what the PSB and how they are engaging with the public. I understand that the last two years we've had the uh, pandemic and it's been incredibly difficult. You know, you're on about the marina walks and that type of thing. I can well understand that. But can we can we have some examples that in the future how you would actually make them more visible? Because as I go back, one of the one of the things we did many, many years ago was a team around a child in Pendra Harwood, which became very, very visible and very successful. And that included the police, included the health service and what have you. So is there something like that we could do to actually promote the PSB? Andrea? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to Councillor Holly for the question. Um, primarily, the public engagement is handled through the work streams. However, just to point out that the public service board meetings are advertised on the council website. They're open to the public to join online. The minutes are available. Um, public question time is held at every joint committee meeting and uh, partners uh, keep actively promoting the good work through social media and online. So. That there is there is a lot of engagement to try and engage the public, but I appreciate like the meeting today. There were no public questions. There are no members of the public attending. Um, we are an overarching strategy board, um, but there is there are plenty of things in terms of public engagement which sit below that. And just to give you some examples, so we've got the school and children's rights network, a total of seven sessions held with two secondary schools and four primary schools in the first week, two weeks of December. Aging well, marina walk and cuppa and a chat sessions with people 50 plus. Weekly marina walks, weekly tea and chats, LGBT plus and 50 plus engagement and BAME uh, 50 plus engagement and the Bramwood Hall Christmas dinner event was used as uh, an engagement event as well, where we did engage with many people to offer support and assistance during that event. Um, there are other stakeholder events as well, which I think Adam referenced earlier, but I could see Adam's got his hand up, so I'll bring him to, to uh, further elaborate. Adam. Thank you. Um, I, I, absolutely, Andrew's uh, answered most of that. Uh, the only final bit is that uh, what the uh, PSB has identified is that we want to engage more with the public. Uh, we have tried. Um, uh, it's almost like Councillor Holly's already read the agenda for, for the next meeting. Um, there is an actual discussion topic on the next agenda, uh, which is identifying how we could improve that public engagement. What more could we do and how can we um, put perhaps an engagement strategy together? So that is one of the topic items to try and push that again. So I welcome the question and it's it's a question we're asking ourselves as part of the PSB and hopefully we'll be able to come up with an answer. Yeah. Can I just follow up on that? Because I was looking at this item in the um, listening to the people, the voice of people 50 plus. Um, I only just sneaked into that myself, but I was just wondering, um, does any of this stuff feed back into the, the, the stakeholders in terms of policy or, or in terms of service delivery? How, how does that feed that process work where you engage a group of people and then um, get opinions on various things? And how does that feed back into the, the, the stakeholders policy processes? OK, so if, if we take, um, if I may, the, the sort of the human rights city, which is, is probably um, a good one. So um, human rights city, what does that mean to to everyone? So the things like the walk, the marina walks, uh, the cover and chat sessions is how we gather that information. Uh, the team then gather that in information. They, they understand what it is that needs to happen. That then comes through to, to us as officers in order to put into our reports, to put into the, the development of sessions um, is fed back to them, but also then comes through to things like the PDC or will do on, on in terms of Human Rights City. Currently comes to the Human Rights City Working Group uh, in terms of what the, the views are and what, what uh, has come from any of the uh, engagement sessions. And that will start to shape what areas we prioritise, how we deliver them. And then that will ultimately come into policies and practices that we need to change through PDCs. Uh, and through cabinet accordingly or through the PSB in terms of multi agencies coming together to formulate a view and a part of the action plan. So is that form formally documented or is it just sort of as, as it comes up in as you discuss these things? 
Yeah, it's it's part of the action plans that that we have. So, I mean, the human rights uh, city, for example, is, is relatively new one in in terms of that way. If we take things like the the climate agenda, uh, we tend to go out, which which we've done in terms of consultation formally. That's part of a consultation strategy that then that feeds back into that formal process. So it depends on where it is, Peter, on on that journey of um, of, of delivery. Okay, thanks for that. Right, uh, Mike White. Mike there, I think he is. Yes, somewhere. thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th th thank you. Um, very, very comprehensive report. You know, you know, tremendous amount of work put in there. Um, I'd like to touch on the um, Swansea local well-being um, in uh, on page thirty-one, bottle point three, in regards to air quality. Are you able to um, let us know that um, since the the opening of the new Mova distributor road in two seventeen? Has this helped to improve the 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 air quality uh, of of the of the uh, old Nice Road in Harvard since the introduction of, of this new road? I can't have got any examples, perhaps if if, if it has shown an, an, an actual reduction in pollution along the the old uh, Harvard the, the Nice Road Harvard. Andrea. Yeah, and thank you, um, Chair, and thank you to Councillor White, and appreciate having the question in advance because I am acutely aware that this is Councillor Mark Thomas's portfolio, but I do have a response. Uh, since the opening of the road in 2016, we have seen a reduction in NO2 of approximately 30% in the Harvard. Uh, this figure, importantly, excludes the impact of reduced traffic during the pandemic. We also saw a 28% reduction in traffic through Havard in the first two years of the relief road being opened. So it has made an impact and it's been very positive. I'm pleased to report. OK. Yeah, yes, okay, that's, 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 uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the information. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Terry. Okay. Yeah, um, I was wondering regarding uh, working with nature, if, um, if the PSB. Sorry, Terry, you seem to have gone mute. OK. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if, um, regarding working with nature, if um, the PSB or the partners have done any work along the uh, River Towy. I was able to spend some time down there um, during lockdown. And the amount of um, different species of animals, you know, ducks, swans, cormorants, and I could go on and on. Wonderful place to be, but I also noticed the amount of um, members of the public using um, the, the cycle tracks and people walking their dogs. But what I'm trying to say is, regarding mental health, it's a wonderful place, you know, to visit. I actually bumped into um, the leader of the council one day down there um, and I found it very interesting and speaking to people down there, they felt the same. So it's a good part of dealing with the well-being, the mental health, but also people enjoying themselves, you know, with the environment and the nature. And also we spent time and we funded um, the men's shed. Um, it was in Blind and Ice. It was uh, funded by board members, city of County of Swansea, they moved now to Pentagon Woods and again mental health is a big issue with them and also they take it into nature at the same time. So that might be something, um, I read the report, maybe I missed parts of it, but what I'm saying is I believe those two things alone are a success and the county should be proud of it. Andrea? Yes, um, thank you to Councillor Hennigan and uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think during this pandemic, um, ourselves included, as well as the members of the public, have never appreciated outdoor green space so much and it's played a vital role during the pandemic in, in terms of health and well-being, uh, when especially particularly during the strict lockdown periods. Um, I actually visited Pentlegare Trust uh, and walked part of the woods last week and had the pleasure. Um, a fantastic natural, uh, you know, place on our doorstep, really. And 
also today I was at the community farm, which is a real asset in terms of dealing with people's health and well-being and uh, providing support to those with mental health issues. Um, we have a lot to be proud of in Swansea. I think we're really fortunate uh, and I'm sure that the leader would um, want to comment on, you know, the beautiful parks that we have and the fantastic initiative that is Men Shared. Um, and but also, um, I do believe Terry, with the particularly with the active travel routes, there is a role in maintenance program um, to make sure that those areas are maintained and and well used. But it's a it's a really good point. It's an important point in terms of our well being assessment. We really do need to make the best of some of the most beautiful places that we've got in our city. And thank you for raising it. Okay. Can I just ask, in terms of partnership, I think the Bay Hospital has proved to be a very successful um, partnership, albeit never used as a hospital, but used as testing and, and things. Is, is the future of that um, going to belong? I understand there's a planning application to extend it for three years. Do we know if that's the case or if that's going to carry on? Anybody? Maybe one for Keith. Keith, there we are. <laughs> I, I knew he was there somewhere. <laughs> So, so the, the 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 Bay Field Hospital is currently being used, uh, or has uh, as a mass vaccination centre. It's being used as a uh, a site for delivery of community phlebotomy services. Uh, and the you're right to say that the the inpatient facility, uh, say inpatient in quotes, uh, facility has never been never been commissioned, uh, and I think is un unlikely to be commissioned. Yeah. For a variety of reasons which need to detain us here the 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 view i think of the health board is that uh, we we would want to um seek to re-provide those services on alternative locations the infrastructure on that site is is not fit for long-term occupation um and uh, we we don't see that that as being part of our, our estate in in the long-term future so any planning application may be required to enable um services to operate there on a, on an interim basis but in the long term that's not featuring in the plans for the health board so, so in the short term what sort of period are you looking at in the short term uh th th that's uh, contingent on the duration of the vaccination campaign and, and yeah. whether alternative locations can be identified particularly for the community phlebotomy service and, and the other services which have been delivered there so the the, the vaccination program was uh, I, I think we'll be winding down by Easter time. Um, the, the, the question about decommissioning is is a, a very live one in the health board and, and discussions are ongoing with the site owner around that. OK, thank you, Keith. Uh, Martin, Martin Nichols. Um, yes, Chair, I hope it's OK for me to come in. I wasn't here for this item, but just to advise, my recollection was that the uh, original development of field hospitals was granted under temporary permitted development rights by Welsh Government. So the reason for a planning application, even if it's for the existing use that's already now there, is just to regularise that because the uh, the permitted development was time limited. So that's why there will need to be a planning application just to formally agree that, even if it's just for a short period of time. OK, thanks for that, Martin. OK, anybody else got any other questions on the Public Service Board? No, we've actually kept it in our time. Our allotted time for that so can i thank um keith and and andrea and all the other officers who've come along to get to answer the questions and very grateful for you to coming along and answering those questions it's been quite a useful session so thank you very much indeed thank you okay we're going to move on to item seven now which is the pre-decision scrutiny covid recovery and investment um, and I think uh, Councillor Rob Stewart is leading on this, um, supported uh, um, by Andrea Lewis. Uh, I don't know if Andrew Stevens is here. I th don't think so. Um, and on, on other officers. So, um, Rob, do you want to do an introduction to this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, very, very quickly, because I'm, I'm sure members will have read the report um, yeah. uh, already. Um, what you'll see there is a collection of investments and additional uh, sums of money that we propose to uh, make available to support a number of critical initiatives, specifically to deal with some of the extra pressures and necessary changes to our infrastructure that we need to make uh, with our IT systems to make sure that we deliver on our cloud uh, proposals, but also make sure that we've got resilience and contingency within our IT estates. So there's, a, there's obviously a big investment package uh, there. In addition, then, there are uh, 
uh, monies uh, towards uh, the additional play areas and uh, you know uh, members will be aware that we've made uh, a number of announcements on this but this is the the money following through in terms of making sure that we commit to enhancing play areas that we control and are responsible for across the city so we will be just to put it into context we will be the only city um, making a commitment to upgrade every play area uh, in every community there is no uh, no one else uh, in wales that is doing uh, that uh, to the scale that we are doing it and obviously there are some other uh, funding announcements in there which are covid related and members would expect as it as has happened in in the last year or so for there to be needs for additional uh, investments as required as we as we get impacts which emerge uh, from the pandemic where we have to utilize welsh government money and other monies available to us uh, in order to offset the covid pressures so um chair i, I i'm sure there'll be plenty of questions i won't yeah. go through the report in detail because i know members will have read it but happy to take questions along with my colleagues Okay, thank you. I notice Andrew Stevens is here, so welcome, Andrew. Um, okay, first question is from Councillor Chris Holly. Yes, thank, thank you very much. I think the, uh, the leaders answered it because we put the question in previously, and that is the rationale for <coughs> COVID recovery and the covering of the report, uh, COVID recovery and investment. <coughs> and, excuse me, why the data section and the Oracle program investment was done under that, but I think he has actually answered that as part of the transformation of um, the digital uh, digital um, architecture of the council. So I think he has answered that question. It's just that uh, it seemed that you know that investment one well, wouldn't have thought it had come under cover, uh, COVID recovery and investment. But I, I, uh, I mean, listen to him. I can understand why he's put it there. Okay, okay, so. I my, I'll ask a question about the Oracle programme then. Um, I had a quick look at the original report from September 2019 in terms of the investment in Oracle and obviously there's been a delay because of COVID presumably that's the reason why that wasn't proceeded with. What I'm struggling to marry up is the costings in the two reports. Um, I think it was something like 3.9 million and quite a lot of re various revenue contributions back in September 2019 and £3.62 million pounds now in terms of this one. So what, what are the, the differences between the two um, programmes in, in terms of that? Is it it's been amended or is it, is it slightly changed or, or have we found savings to actually do it in a different way? Chair, uh, Chair I think it's both, but I'll bring Sarah Lackenby in to, to give yeah. you a bit more of a detailed breakdown of, of where the money's going. But you are right, it's, it's a combination of things coming together, but Sarah will take you through that one. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's it is it's be mostly because of extension of time uh, because we've had to delay. So there was the um, uh, I think with with two years that it was in the original report it was around four point eight million, and then this is an additional um, three point six. But it's because of the additional in time because we were originally going to develop uh, deliver it within a year, but because of COVID. Uh, it's now three years. So uh, backfill of staff working on the project for longer. So we're backfilling staff in finance, procurement service centre, HR, uh, buildings and property services. We've also had an increase in licensing as well because we've had a load of new people that have started because of COVID, uh, people in TTP, people in social services. We've had a lot of new starters. Uh, so, and also we've had more people using Oracle because of working from home. So people who didn't originally need to work on Oracle, but then moved to ha moved to work from home and were then picking up other duties have had to have access to an Oracle license. So that increased. Um, we also have to have the technical expertise for longer. So although the, the, the it's the same, it's the same pro, um, what we're spending it on sort of the same, but it's sort of, uh, it's more of it to a certain extent uh, because we need to have that technical expertise for longer and then and obviously uh, the supplier building the system uh, configuring the system is for longer uh, we have also because the staff as well are um, they have so much business as usual as well and they are res still responding as you know to covid so it's mostly the staff in the service center and finance teams are significantly under pressure at the minute, as you know, because of um, uh, helping with payments, helping with 
uh, recruitment of social workers, recruitment of other staff. They've been helping with re um, you know, recruitment into TTP. There's, and there's also some business as usual work which was delayed from COVID, which is now being picked up. So there's a huge amount of business as usual work, which is putting pressure on the project. So we are also bringing in some, uh, asking some of the um, externals to help us with that as well, to get, take some pressure off the staff, which is uh, which is a slight difference. And there is a, a bit of contingency in the budget as well. But the, as I say, the majority of it is because we're doing it longer uh, because of having to, as you remember, we had to pause last year uh, completely. We had to completely pause the project um, because of co well, uh, 2020. We started again in February uh, 2021 uh, and even then um, we were still grappling as was the supplier with the uh, with Delta and other things even when we restarted. Okay. Can I just, just answer the question? Yeah can I just see when that use that word additional um, is this 3.62 million pounds on top of the 3.9 or is it instead of us I'm not clear about? It's on top. So what's the total cost of this Oracle program in capital and revenue terms? So in, it, it's all one-off cost in terms of, uh, right. I mean, obviously it's been coming, as you, you see in the report and in the previous report, it's coming from uh, from different streams. But in terms of all one-off costs, the original project was 4.8 and this is an additional 3.6. Right, so so about, okay, about uh, nearly £9 million pounds then. My maths may have failed me on that, but... Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. Rob, do you want to come in on this as well? Eight and a half, isn't it? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, yeah so, so as Sarah says, it is it is additional cost to the original figure that you had. Right. I, I think a couple of things to note, which Sarah touched upon there, obviously, uh, we're looking at close to a million pounds for additional licences uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, you would expect us because we had to move incredibly quickly when uh, the pandemic hit to allow people to work <laughs> from home and that meant uh, providing more devices, more licenses out and it, and it made sure that we were able to move more quickly uh, to everybody working in an agile way and and that will be an ongoing cost I guess for us you know for, for a period uh, if, we, if we continue to do that. But I think it's important as well you know we, 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 we've learned the lessons of the past in terms of making sure that if we're going to go to the newest technology which is Oracle, Cloud, all of the, all of the ways in working that are in the long term lower costs and the best technology that we need to make sure that we do that in a planned way and you'll be aware from the previous updates we've given you around what the finance teams have been doing you know they've had to design systems to get support out to um, businesses you know we pu pushed out 100 on odd million pounds of support to bu businesses uh, we've put in place um, systems to pay people for um, you know, school meals because they were now we were having to provide uh, payments to to people. All of these things have had to take priority uh, over the plan that we had in place at the time when we when you first saw it. Saw it. So a lot of this, like it will be, you know, I think the variance in the budget Ben Smith gave you last year was about a hundred million. Um, uh, and again, this is a variance primarily due to COVID. No other. Uh, reasons. These are costs that we couldn't uh, avoid. Uh, and again, I think just to keep in mind, given the international way in which uh, cloud operates and the elements are provided <laughs> to the council and other big partners, then it's not just the impacts of COVID in this country, but the impacts of COVID in a number of countries that also impact on our ability to deliver that uh, you know, change programme. So it is a really challenging uh, situation. And I I can't pay high enough tribute to, to Sarah and the team for the work that they've done to make sure that not only do all of our systems continue to work, but that we've increased our capacity, we've enabled new ways of working and at, at sort of breakneck speed, delivered all of the systems that Welsh Government have asked us to do, take on all of the extra um, systems that we would need to run things like TTP, etc. Uh, you know, skill up the staff, provide all of the technology to make that happen and kept everything else running at the same time. So, you know, it's I think when you look at it in that context, it's it's uh, a really, really impressive uh, period of work. But this eight and a half million is, is the final cost now. We're not going to find further costs coming down the line. 
Well, it's, it's the best we know at the present time and it should cover yeah. everything that we need to do. But I guess, you know, the, I guess the one caveat would be is yeah. that if a new vi variant emerged yeah. tomorrow that, that absolutely took us back to square one of the pandemic, then clearly we would have new challenges, wouldn't we? So, but it should cover everything we need in order to deliver the programme as we understand it today. OK, Andrew, do you want to come in on this? Yes, please. Um, I'd like to add my thanks to the team as well. Um, there is um, also, in addition to the, the long list that the leaders mentioned in terms of the necessary changes, the grants being administered, um, there, were, there was a significant amount of support given to housing, um, which saw a transition of our council tenants move from uh, paying their, their rent in local housing offices, which they couldn't do during the pandemic, to move in online. And we're now going to be seeing the launch of the housing portal shortly, where we will see most services <coughs> for people, council tends to make life a lot easier for them to pay their bills and to report any issues on, on through the housing app. So, you know, th this has been a real shift change. It's something that we were on, on this journey anyway, but it's fair to say that COVID has accelerated the home working and the smarter working for us as a council. Uh, and it, there's been an incredible amount of work. I was initially coming in, but I think the leader has raised it, that uh, Sarah's articulated um, the pressures that we've had as a council, but our partners have also had pressures with the Delta variant, and this has also had an impact uh, on the Oracle delivery, which was outside of our control. But um, yeah, my thanks to the team and uh, it's it's necessary for us to move into the 21st century to modernise our services. And lots of people don't see the back office services, HR, finance, but they are the backbone of the authority. And we must make sure that this is delivered on time. Uh, and uh, I know Sarah is driving this forward. So thank you. OK, Paxton, is this on, on this issue or have you got us a separate question altogether? S same issue, Chairman. OK, come in then. Um, obviously, this this process has been going on for some time now, and I know there's been concerns expressed in terms of the exposure we are if we had a major IT failure. Have we yet got to the stage where we are fully covered, or when do we expect to be in a situation that we will be fully covered, so that if we had a major problem anywhere in particular, that we couldn't, that we could always be able to recover from it? Sarah? Yes, uh, we've we've been systematically um, upgrading everything over time. So yes, I mean, uh, um, we, we'd had, um, if you remember, we'd had some problems with uh, the storage arrays many, many years ago, and we also had problems with the phone system. All that is now upgraded. And also uh, part of what you see in the report in terms of the data center is moving to hybrid cloud, which obviously helps in terms of resilience uh, hugely. So um, we've done a huge amount already and there's still, there's always more to do. But yes, in terms of um, the, the major crucial systems, uh, Oracle is kind of the last the last part of that. So once we get this live in October, because um, uh, this is going to be a cloud system, then um, the, the major systems are, 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 you know, as resilient as we can make them. And then we're just continuing uh, to improve that as time goes on. Do we have actually a full um, backup plan in case of failure in any of these systems where we can go, save Oracle failed or one of the other fa systems fails? We have uh, this disaster recovery planning. There's yeah. also business continuity planning, uh, which is happening in services because obviously it's not just about what happens within uh, digital and IT. It's also what services can do because, you know, if, if there was, say, uh, an entire grid taken out for some reason and there was there was nothing yes we, you know we, we can do certain things but there'd still need to be some business continuity within services uh to allow for the fact that there may not be any it at some point in the event of a major disaster so there's a there's a mix of the two okay so uh, well, you just to come back for a second yeah Paxton, do you want to come back sorry yeah come on. is there is there a risk that we could lose key data on a permanent basis still Sorry, Paxton, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear that. Is there still the risk that we could lose key data on a permanent basis as as, as seen standard currently? Uh, lose key data in what way? Sorry. Well, obviously, we hold a lot of information which we use for various purposes to provide various services for people, etc. If there's anything in that sort of area, basically, that would uh, 
I suppose enable us to have a real problem providing the service that we would want to be be delivering. Uh, in terms of the uh, the systems themselves, uh, as opposed to you mean the system the, the data is held in. Yeah. Sorry, I, I mean, is there any risk at all to us being able to, in that sense, to to provide that service if we did have a failure currently in any particular area? Sorry, uh, perhaps you're not being clear enough or not? Uh, no, I think I think you know we are as resilient as we can be at the moment. I think yes. I mean, it it is we've done so much work in terms of this over the strategy over the last few years that yes, I think we, you know in terms of the systems that we have and in terms of uh, especially moving into cloud. Uh, that you know there shouldn't be obviously there's um, there's other reasons for loss of data but in terms of the systems themselves yes we're we're in it we're in a good place with that I would assume all the data is backed up on a daily basis and it's the systems which are the vulnerable yeah. points so so chair traps to be yeah. helpful yeah, Rob, yeah, yeah, I, think, I think I think because I think the question Paxton was was asking I, I think was you yeah. know do we have resilience in the system and are we, do we have backups etc and are the systems out to support yeah. I guess is the other question the element to it so I think as Sarah said there's a plan for all of that and the systems are supported and I know the team have done work to ensure that we if we have uh, an issue with any remaining system that hasn't migrated that we have the ability to get support to uh, do a fix on that system or a patch or whatever needs to be done so all, all of that is there i think the other part then is around well even when we've migrated everything could there be an event that where where some data could be lost well i think that will inevitably persist in any system whatever you have all we can do is to reduce that as much as possible now as sarah said most of those uh, systems have already migrated it's oracle that's uh, that's remaining and that's where um, we now need to make sure that we have a good migration plan that we've got good backup in the meantime and we've got a contingency there um, but i don't think anybody paxton can give you a, an absolute uh, a, you know guarantee on any system that there won't be some data loss should some event occur but you know we're as resilient as we possibly can be. Okay, perhaps I should have asked the question: Are we at the stage where we are as resilient as we can possibly be? Yeah, I, th I okay. think I think they've said yes to that. Yeah, I think yes. that's comforting yeah. to know that as well at yeah. this stage yeah. because I know that hasn't been the stage a couple of yeah. years ago. I don't think you'd have been giving me that answer. Yeah, and if, if you're backing up your data on a daily basis, then any data loss should be minimised as a result of that. I would guess. Yeah. OK, um, Chris, you had your hand up on this issue. Are you OK with this or do you want to come on to your next yeah, question? Yeah, Sarah's answered the questions. All okay. I want to know is about the data, data okay. stuff. Do you want to ask your question about skate parks then? Yeah, OK. Um, the investment in skate parks, you know, great right across Swansea. Um, I wonder if you could give us some more details on the approach which will be taken in particular areas, you know, um, where they'll actually go and what benefits we can provide. Because one thing, obviously, what's happened down on Mum's Road is one thing, and but there are other areas in Swansea which actually could do them better than down there, you know. Um, and I remember the one that was by the leisure centre, as we all know, and that was extremely well, Ian, because it was close to the city centre. And what I'm concerned about is we have an area, say, Morriston Park, or up in, I don't know, Ponte de Lice or wherever. Um, what, what plans do we have to extend this out beyond uh, the city? How advanced are those plans? Yeah, yeah Rob. Yeah, th th thanks, Chair. If um, uh, with, with the with the committee's indulgence, they will know that I uh, declared an interest and didn't take part in the Mumbles skate park yeah. decision and the land transfer. Yeah, yeah. Um, given that we've got a live judicial review still, um, you know, I, I won't make any comment directly on that. But I think I can ask Councillor Holly's question any answer Councillor Holly's question anyway without re reference to that. So the the five hundred thousand that we uh, announced uh, some weeks ago is there to to look at not just uh, improving the existing facilities but looking at where we can fill gaps in provision so the first stage of that has been for um, our officers to look at the existing condition of of the equipment we've already got and i think we've got eight or nine uh, existing uh, skate skate facilities around swansea uh, the the aim would be then once we have that to to talk to to members and invite uh, members to uh, bid in to to our to see if they wish to have facilities in their area and for us to look at, at a strategic way of trying to make sure that we got facilities across the county um, and and certainly in the areas where there's highest demand so that's the plan it hasn't been uh, fully 
defined yet. And, and again, when we uh, have a better view of the level of interest from members and from communities, we may uh, look at adding some further resources uh, as we have done with, with the general play facilities. So uh, that's the plan. But, you know, we're keen to make sure that every area that needs it has a skate facility uh, in a reasonable uh, uh, distance from, from the community. So, you know, that, that's the plan to get uh, equal provision across the county. Okay, Chris. Thank you, Leader. Can I can I put a bid in then? Uh, really, <laughs> not not for any particular area. No, for Birkenhead area. Councillor Black, there's no need for you to, to worry. Um, but years ago, we looked at as a as a council uh, getting hold of a mobile one that we could take around to uh, car parks like the big community centre, car parks, etc. On mm -hmm. a a couple of weekends uh, every every year uh, that by providing a facility right across the area i wonder if we could ask our officers to look at that possibility to to do it in the future so that no one area would actually lose out and in, even you know we could actually take them wherever we wanted to then yeah, yeah i'm sure i'm sure officers can look at that not a problem council holly will will we'll feed <clears throat> that into the uh, discussion around what the options are for a mobile unit yeah, pop-up okay, skateboard parks, yeah. Okay, right, um, Peter Jones, home, home working. Yes, thank you, Chair. One of the interesting consequences of the pandemic, mm. of course, has been the growth of home working, particularly for desk-based office staff. Um, and I'm wondering, therefore, in terms of the future of Swansea Council and staff, uh, what assumptions, if any, are being made for the longer term of the continuation of home working uh, beyond the pandemic, if there is a beyond, and that's a question in itself, but and what are the implications for the council in terms of future required office space and the costings associated with it? Business. In other words, do we foresee home working continuing indefinitely into the future, or are we anticipating uh, post-pandemic a return to something closer to the pre-pandemic office-based system. Thank you. Well, Chair, would you like me to begin on that one? I, I yes, know officers may, do, yeah. may, may want to comment as well. Uh, look, my, my personal view, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's still yet to be fully uh, tested in terms of where we'll end up. But my, my view is that, um, you know, there, there is a, a fair um, contingent of staff who are, who are itching to get back into the office for, for various reasons, uh, not least that for many people working from home is a difficult um, thing to do given that they may have many family members all wanting to work in a, in a very small space. Um, you know, generally though, um, there will be jobs that people will be able to continue to do from home. Uh, where there are other jobs which are frontline, which will need people to to continue to be uh, available and in a an office or a uh, a workplace environment. My personal view, in terms of what that'll mean for the council's estate and and for the staff, is that you know we would be keen to continue with the agile working program and to con continue to give flexibility to staff to be able to work from home when it's appropriate uh, and for that to be probably uh, a mixed environment. I think that's, you know, having talked to other major employers and other um, uh, commentators on this, is that we're likely to see that sort of working arrangement emerge where there's still going to be a, a requirement for office space and for people to work in a dedicated work environment. Um, but that there will probably be a more fluid arrangement in terms of how many days a week uh, that the, the people choose to be in the office or need to be in the office uh, and therefore working at home. And, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, that's something that will become a bit more crystallised over the, the year or so ahead, as hopefully we emerge from, uh, from restrictions for good um, and we get back to some new normality around working. Um, certainly, uh, uh, Councillor Jones, uh, Peter, that the, the, the evidence that we're seeing in terms of applications coming in for developers who are, you know, not council funded and not related to the council, but are bringing 
their own private money to create new office space in Swansea. The demand still seems to be um, pretty strong there. And certainly, uh, I think evidence from cities like London and elsewhere is that, uh, you know, demand is returning for, for office space. I think there was a, a large purchase of uh, offices for some of the major multinationals recently in, in London that I read. Um, certainly for our our purposes here, you know, the 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 space that we're creating in the in the Kingsway with the innovation hub and the and the and the village there, the the work that is going on in terms of the public sector hub and, and a new home for for our staff as we move out of the civic centre, um, plus the private demand that's being delivered uh, in a number of other locations, uh, the demand for office space remains strong and I think that's right because uh, I think we, we will see uh, a resurgence of office working in the next few months. Wikipedia. Uh, sorry, sorry, thank you, Reader, for that. Thank you. Yeah. In terms of home work, I mean, obviously, we've been put in this situation where a lot of our staff are having to work from home, and I fully understand that many of them would, would, would look to want to get back to the office. And uh, I personally, I welcome being able to get back to my own office, which is currently occupied by my wife. But I think. Um, well, from the public public's point of view, the thing which has come across to me is members of the public ringing me up and saying, I can't get hold of X and such and such or this department because they're working from home. And I think that's an issue for us in terms of a public facing organisation where you do have a lot of staff working from home to ensure that the public is still able to actually access through traditional means by telephoning, if need be, um, the various people to actually get queries. I just want what's our experience in terms of that? I don't know, maybe yeah. Rob or Adam want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'll go first on this one. But I, I think, look, at various times during the, the pandemic and the different lockdowns that we've had, clearly we have had to move staff oh, yeah. from their from their uh, previous roles into the temporary roles that they needed to be because we needed to service new areas uh, given the, the threats that the pand pandemic, uh, uh, you know, gave to us. Um, I think... In, inevitably, that was going to mean that some services were deprioritized or yeah. or actually unavailable for a period of time. But largely, I mean, I think overall, we've kept nearly all of our services running for most of the period, and we should be really proud of that. I think wh where we need to get to, Chair, is, you know, as we return to the new working arrangements and people then uh, move to that uh, more blended way of working, I guess, is making sure that we have the the cover in at all periods uh, required by by the business need for people to be able to respond uh, in the in the time skills that the public expect uh, to inquiries that that they would make. So you know it's it's returning to a more normal sort of uh, operation in that respect. But actually, I think uh, again, as we've learned during the pandemic, being able to work remotely can actually give us benefits on top of what we were able to provide previously. Oh, yeah. uh, and um, you know, just because you're working from a different location shouldn't mean that that service is any less. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I t totally agree. You know, you there are benefits from working r from home. And that, and that for, for everybody. But I think sometimes the public are finding difficult adjusting, not just because staff are being allocated elsewhere, but because they've struggled to get through, say, to car parking or to the rates, uh, council tax department or whatever on the phone. Adam, do you want to add to this or are you? Are you it's fine. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, again, I, I think Rob said most of it, certainly in terms of the challenges that we've had of moving at speed that we did. But um, in terms of, of certainly telephony and, and certainly aspects of channel shift, one of the things that's been really successful is, is the, the move over to the web for those that are um, e-enabled uh, and have given people accessibility to access the council across a 24-7 platform, whereas before obviously it was tend to be more nine to five um, or certainly eight till six. So I, I think it, there has been great strength and I think it's an education piece where we've uh, re-educated um, our residents in terms of access channels they can use to gain services and I think over time that that's improved and we've certainly seen a dramatic increase in web traffic uh, utilizing facilities and as we've brought new things online that's freed up more of the phone lines where demand has been high where people have been able to use web uh, and do it at different times so at peak times obviously uh, there has been uh, some challenges but generally now, all telephony um, has been switched so that wherever people are working, it's seamless. So whether it's the contact centre, whether it's into one of the service areas, other than where there has been high demand 
where lots of people have tried at any one time, which was the same even before COVID, we've managed to, to um, change the telephony service so that, it, it, that people are contactable. Save that, some people are just busy uh, and doing their job and so aren't always available when perhaps some people would like them to be available just because they're dealing with um, a certain aspect of, of work. So um, I, I think there has been, you know, we, I think we should congratulate ourselves on what we have achieved, but it's not the finished item yet. And I think, uh, you know, as Rob said, you know, going forward, there will be improvements, we'll continue, we'll look at different ways of which uh, people engage with the council, even when we've moved back, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's all back into the building, uh, there will be different ways of contacting the council and also making sure that the information we pass out uh, is clear to stop that traffic coming into the council wherever we can. Okay, that's fine. Anybody else got any questions on this particular item at all? No? Okay, well, thank <coughs> you very much for that. Um, we're going to move on then to the leaders question answer session, um, supported again by Adam. Um, and uh, the first question I've got on that is Peter Jones on Brexit. Currently muted, Peter. That's it. Try again. I was about to say no decent meeting would be uh, complete without a question on Brexit. Uh, <laughs> so here we are. And oh. seriously, um, one of the consequences, of course, of leaving the European Union uh, has been uh, that we're no longer in, going to be as a country in receipt of uh, European Union structural funds. Uh, and although the money associated from in contributing to that from the UK government has now been returned to Westminster. There continues to be uncertainty around what might then come back uh, to uh, the UK, uh, to, sorry, to Wales and to Swansea within Wales from the shared prosperity fund or whatever equivalent to that might be. So I'm wondering in terms of that, um, do we have a figure for the previous levels of EU funding uh, of specific to benefit to Swansea and what we might expect going forward uh, from the new EU, so sorry, from the new, new shared prosperity fund that uh, we anticipate will replace the structural funds? Now, what are the implications for Swansea? And if, as is likely, the structural funds will be uh, the, sorry, the prosperity fund will be less in, in total than the than the structural funds. Um, what, if any, might be the future consequences financially for Swansea? Uh, thank you, Chair. Rob? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Peter, for the question. Um, in terms of uh, Brexit, uh, you know, my view is uh, very cool. clear that um, uh, you know, Brexit uh, and certainly the deal that's been agreed uh, with Brexit, whether you agreed with Brexit or not, this is not the deal that anybody expected. And it's it's proven to be uh, an incredibly bad deal for the UK. It hasn't, uh, you know, taken back control of the borders. If that's what people thought they needed, that's clearly not happened. Uh, it's created massive amounts of red tape. Uh, for businesses, made it incredibly difficult for our businesses to trade. Um, it's it's uh, left us out of key programmes that were bringing huge benefit to, to this country. And, uh, you know, uh, in terms of alternative deals, well, they seem to be few and far between. And if they have been struck, they're worse than what we had. So uh, at any level, um, you know, the, the, the situation that's been agreed and the, and the deal that was agreed is a very bad one for the UK. Um, I, th I think just to put it into context as well, I think the um, the um, uh, budget of uh, budget responsibility office and, uh, and the other major financial commentators have, have made it very clear that the impacts of of the COVID pandemic, which we've been talking about, um, are significantly less than the impacts of the bad Brexit deal that's been agreed, and and Brexit will continue, or the deal that's been agreed will continue to be a huge. Uh, negative impact on, on the UK economy and our ability to to become 
uh, a wealthy, successful country. Um, in terms of your direct question, Peter, I think uh, when you look at the overarching amount of money that was available in each of the phases to Swansea, um, it's around 100 million, we think. But of course, not all of that would have come through the council. It would have gone to HE, Enviro, um, HE and, and other programmes that we wouldn't have been directly involved in. But we think uh, around 100 million. Uh, and of course, in the latest scheme, we, we've been able to secure funding before we formally leave the end of the programmes uh, in Europe to do things like um, the Palace Theatre, the Albert Hall, the, the Kingsway, uh, the Alex building, um, that, uh, that obviously with Trinity, and employability and workways programmes, skills for industry, uh, and a number of other, other schemes. The bad news, and it continues to be bad news, is that, you know, Wales uh, and the Welsh Government set out a position where there was not to be less than £375 million worth of funding, because that's the amount that we had at the time when we exited the uh, uh, European Union. Of course, um, I always remind people that that was the minimum that we had at the time we left. And of course, prices and, and availability of resources increases uh, since then. So really, if we're going to keep pace with what we would have had uh, in the European arrangements, we should be expecting more than the 375 million. Now, um, you'll be aware that under the first uh, initial allocations, Wales has had 40 million as opposed to the 375 million that we would do. Um, now, we are promised more, but we haven't had it at this point in time. So, you know, on the on the first go, we, we've ended up in a significantly worse position nationally than we were promised. That is appalling. Um, in terms of the Shared Prosperity Fund and the other funds, well, we still don't have detail of the next round of, of those arrangements. And we don't know when the... Uh, the uh, processes will be released, the applications will be live. We're expecting a white paper. We've been told uh, it was going to be the 24th of January. It now, from, from what we're hearing from, from UK government, looks closer to being uh, mid-February uh, for a release of the information and the, and the white paper being published. And, and of course, what it's going to do is what it did in the first round of the Community Renewal Fund and the other funds that were available to us. It condensed the period at which we were able to bid in uh, two funds. And what that meant was that we weren't able to be as strategic uh, uh, as we would like to have been or uh, submit the sort of bids that we would like to have submitted into those programmes. So again, we are looking at that, uh, and this is not unique to Swansea, it's, it's what we've said uh, to both the UK and um, UK government ministers in recent times, is that the longer we have to know what the process is going to be, what monies are available to us, how our bids are going to be evaluated, and if we're not successful, or if we are successful, why we weren't successful or why we were unsuccessful, then the better chance we've got of putting in more strategic, efficient uh, and effective bids. So uh, I remain uh, really, really concerned, uh, Peter, that we're going to end up uh, with significantly less money, a significantly small pie uh, than we had, uh, and a different way of allocating uh, money as well, because we knew in, in the European Union model that we were likely to get uh, funds on the basis of need, uh, and we're now into a very... Uh, competitive process where we're bidding not just against other uh, localities in Wales, but against uh, uh, England, Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland. And there's no guarantee from uh, UK government that we'll get uh, funding on the basis of need or that we'll get it at all. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a really difficult position. And I, and I just feel so sorry for our communities because this is the future that they now face for the for, for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Rob. Um... I think what you're telling us very clearly is that Brexit is bad for Swansea and bad for Wales. Thank you. Yeah, bad I for the UK that. as well. <laughs> and bad for the UK. <laughs> I got that as well, yeah. OK, uh, Chris Holly. Uh, it's Sue Jones's question, Peter. Oh, Sue, Sue, Susan Jones then. It's Just... really, um, Chris and I were both concerned about the city centre and what you're doing growing the number of empty shops in the the units in the city centre can you see can you tell us how many empty shops there are now 
and what type of businesses we have lost in the city centre and the plans forward really, and what's happening to Debenhams. Sorry to be a little bit uh, vague on that, but it's a concern of a lot of people that the city centre seems to be just being left behind. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, well, Sue, I don't, I don't uh, hold to the premise uh, that you put there that um, you know there's a there's a decline necessarily in the number of shops. We, like every other city centre in in the UK, we and, and town centre, we've been hit by the impacts of COVID and furlough, and and of course uh, a number of national failures occurred. Uh, the Acadia Group and, and some big names disappeared, including Debenhams from the High Street, and Swansea won't be immune to those failures, but. What we have been able to do um, is obviously um, weather a lot of that. And of course, most places around the UK won't have the investment programme going into the city centre that we've currently got with Copper Bay, the arena, uh, the investment in Wine Street to shore up the hospitality businesses, the new Castle Gardens is coming along, the new um, uh, library and uh, local services hub, the delivery of the city deal projects like 7172 Kingsway, uh, the new office developments, both private and public, the re 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 regeneration of the Palace Theatre and the Albert Hall, um, the um, delivery of the Kingsway Works, which again is uh, allowing private sector companies to now come in and uh, buy up buildings and, and renovate them. Um, we're also in discussions, as you would, would expect us to be now with our strategic partner, Urban Splash, about the next phase of developments, including uh, phase two of Copper Bay, which is the area from Oystermouth Road up to St Mary's Church. Uh, and of course, that will include the delivery of the public sector hub, which will secure or create uh, 7,000 plus jobs in that area. So, uh, you know, yes, there has been, as you would expect, a, a significant jolt from um, COVID. Uh, in terms of the quadrant, uh, which obviously, you know, we have a significant interest in, there were seven vacant stores of which four now have been relet. Um, there's a significant repurposing going on at the moment in terms of stores that are that were empty from national failures rather than local failures. Uh, in terms of Debenhams, I can't say too much in terms of where what we are uh, doing uh, to fill that, other than to say there are a number of options on the table, one of which uh, we are pursuing uh, with aggression in terms of finding and securing a major high street name to, to take uh, the place of Debenhams in the quadrant. Um, alongside that, we are looking at other options, should that not be possible, uh, in terms of repurposing uh, that store into other units. Um, but again, um, there are a number of options on the table with that. I think what we have the benefit of here, though, is that there is widespread acknowledgement that uh, the regeneration of Swansea is, is taking place at pace that um, not just council and, and government money is going in, but significant amounts of private money are going in. And therefore, it's an attractive offer for people to come now and invest in Swansea and to uh, take up empty units. So um, uh, again, uh, Sue, I, I don't hold to the, um, to the uh, view that it's a declining picture. There's definitely been an impact, as you would expect. We're not immune to that. Um, but we are seeing um, a, a turnover of stores and new people opening stores in the city centre. Thank you for that, Rob. But uh, when I hear of people always going to Cardiff to shop, there's no attempt at Swansea as, as a destination for shopping at the minute. And that saddens me. Swansea is losing out big time for shopping for the local communities. Well, well, Sue, just to, just to um, uh, say again, because it's I know it's easy to to look at Cardiff as a shopping destination. Cardiff is a multifaceted destination. It's because uh, people who go to Cardiff will generally go there for a day out. They'll look for potentially going for a meal as well as doing some shopping, possibly see a show. And that's why the onset of things like the arena and the creation of the new units around uh, Copper Bay. And, and, and just to say, all of those units, those new units around Copper Bay have been let to independent local uh, businesses in Swansea to build on that unique uh, offering that Swansea has. Now, again, it's been very purposely done this way in terms of fixing the uh, opportunity to make Swansea a destination, to add the leisure aspects to it. Um, the phase two of, of Copper Bay was always due to be more of a mixed environment, which will be those new offices, as I said, the new living 
um, units or living accommodations, uh, flats, apartments uh, that we would want to put there. But then that draws in the, the additional retailers and the additional food and beverage operators that will take uh, units within uh, phase two of Copper Bay and also shore up what we need to do in terms of Oxford Street, um, the uh, quadrant and then that new development itself. So you can't just say we'd like this store to come to Swansea unless you product unless you provide the the rationale uh, and the numbers that make make sure it's viable for that store or that business to open in Swansea. But that's what we've been creating. So um, the biggest threat to Swansea city centre has been out of town. Actually, uh, it's been if you look at, uh, at where people and the trends of where we were leaking money before COVID hit, uh, it would have been uh, Llanelli and uh, the the development down there. The out of town development and, and of course that development which was which was passed outside of our control because obviously we had uh, no influence to stop that development um, has done significant damage to Carmarthenshire uh, sorry to Carmarthen uh, town centre and obviously to Llanelli itself so it's been Trostra that has been the biggest threat to us um, but city centres have to become a different type of um, centre in the 21st century so they need to be multifaceted they need to be a destination themselves offering leisure retail and food and beverage and that's what we're creating thank you rob okay uh chris do you want to follow up on this yeah um i could go on for hours about this but i'm not going to be basically no uh basically what a lot of what the leader has said is, is is perfectly right you know all cities have got to be destinations but um it's the destination and i'm not i don't want to talk about cardiff or bristol or anywhere else but if you look at successful cities yes there's a mix of developments and what have you but they have got a central core shop in which unfortunately because of various reasons uh, we, we've lost out on and i understand that there is a major store look a major company looking at debenhams i think the, the real issue about this is i don't um is what are the private companies going to invest in in swansea now we've seen all the um the student accommodation which is welcomed you know very common that will bring people into the city center but we've heard about what's going on the the king's way and we've seen the business plans for that uh we've seen what's likely to happen in the albert hall which will be a mixture of commercial plus but there'll be accommodation as well uh, and we've noticed also what's going into the palace theater so i, I think really the question's got to be asked is what are or what is the pi private sector going to invest in in a city centre? Now, I, I, you know, you mentioned the uh, hub that is likely to go in into the second and third phase of of the city deal. Again, that is uh, predicated on the fact that there's going to be national or money from the, U the UK government, the Welsh government, or city deal money going to be used to develop that. So. I, that's the question I would like to answer, if you could answer it, Rob, and that is what is the public, what is the private sector going to invest in other than uh, student accommodation? Yeah, uh, so look, let's start from the strategy, first of all. So the strategy is really, really simple. We need to get more people living, working and enjoying in the city centre. That That's the, the strategy in three words, OK? Um, We've yep. seen a significant yeah, right. amount, of, a significant amount of private sector investment in student accommodation. Chris, you're quite right on that. Um, and you know, just to remind everybody, because I know uh, the public like to think the council are building student accommodation. We haven't built any student accommodation. It's all been private sector, um, and and that is, uh, you know, a, a really advantageous thing for the city centre because it helps with that living uh, cohort in terms of if you want to regenerate places like high street you have to get more people living there as well as working there as well as visiting there so you know that that's that's key to those areas to do that because you're building communities and vibrant um uh, vibrancy into a 24-hour economy for the city center by doing that what you do then on top of that um is we've been looking at office accommodation so that's where the 7172, the Kingsway comes in that creates, uh, you know, room for 600 people to work in that building. And we have a number of potential tenants already uh, prepared to take space in that building. 
You've mentioned already, Chris, the repurposing of the Palace Theatre. Uh, and again, that will be home to office space uh, and, a, and a unique office working environment. And we've got Tramshed Tech on board uh, to, to help us fill that building. And they, and they are very confident doing that. Outside of that, and I don't know whether it's uh, been refused or approved, but you've got some applications going through for Princess Way today um, for further office accommodation uh, along the strip from, from Castle Gardens down. Uh, and then we are looking ourselves to move our staff out of the Civic Centre so the Civic Centre can be repurposed for that site to be redeveloped with our partners Urban Splash. Uh, that plan will be uh, shared more publicly in due course uh, in terms of what the elements on the Civic Centre will be. But it means that we move our staff out of the Civic Centre because most of the staff in the Civic Centre don't leave the Civic Centre to go into the city centre in the dinner time and don't take time out to go shopping in the city centre. Well, again, by moving several thousand staff into the city centre, that means that there's much more opportunity for them to, to do unplanned spend, to spend their dinner hours and other times in the city centre supporting businesses. In terms of that new hub, yes, you're absolutely right, Chris, it, it is likely to house not just Welsh Government staff, but staff from other UK Government departments, as well as potentially, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for further office space to take um, additional private sector um, businesses in buildings there. We are looking at an arrangement to deliver that uh, through the Urban Splash uh, uh, partnership that we've just signed. So it's not necessarily looking to run to UK Government or, or for us to fund these buildings directly ourselves. That's one of many options. Um, in addition for phase two, uh, as I said, once you've got more people then already living uh, as students, but also we're looking to, to build along with the private sector, uh, more apartments for private living as well as private rent um, in the city centre, that will add to the number of people living as well as the number of people working. Once you've got that, it makes it much easier, as I said, to then make the case for um, the investment uh, and uh, for more businesses to open retail stores and to open food and beverage uh, opportunities in the centre. And of course, with the arena running at that point, you know, 220 events per year and hopefully having event days running to more than 300, then you've got a regular heartbeat of people coming to the city centre who will want to stay in hotels, want to take taxis, eat in restaurants, do all of those other things. Now, when the Albert Hall comes online, that will have an 800 capacity performance space in it. Um, you've got the Branwyn Hall that can hold 450. You've got the Liberty that can hold 25,000. You've got Singleton Park that can hold 40,000. So the opportunity for us to hold major events in the city increases as well as us to, to be part of the conferencing network and to hold major conference events. Uh, that will help as well fill hotel rooms and to bring people to the city on a more regular basis. So it's a, it's a very connected strategy uh, and all of these actions are necessary in order of fixing that. And of course, the, the, the additional stuff then around, um, you know, uh, public realms, castle gardens, wine street, etc. Uh, adds to all of that. But the only thing I would correct Chris on is it's not what they will do, it's what they are doing. Because again, uh, you know, the, the city deal interventions that we were, we've taken forward have given the private sector confidence. So the things like the, the Princess Way scheme that's with planning today wouldn't have taken place had we not have, have delivered the city deal. And again, phase two of the city deal wouldn't have happened hadn't we not done the heavy lifting on phase one. But we don't expect uh, as part of phase two for the council to be doing all of the heavy lifting on that. We'll be, we'll be a partner in it, but we, we will be expecting significant amounts of private sector investment to flow with that. And we are talking already about that. So just to reassure, it's already happening. You know, there are a number of live sites across the city centre where private sector are now investing. In. And again, I think Ian, Ian uh, Morgan of Morganstone was, was very clear on the development advisory group yesterday that actually Swansea has overtaken Cardiff uh, in terms of attractiveness for developers. Okay, Adam, do you want to add to this? Uh, uh, the Rob's doing quite well on his on his own mind. Yeah, I was I wasn't going to add much. It, it was just a, a stat which I, I think sort of marks uh, certainly around the city centre that certainly in the last twenty months, um, almost twice as many new businesses have set up in the town centre as have closed. So I think you know many of those are attractive because of the great work that's happening, because of the new developments, because actually the footfall 
will see that increase coming through and, and that commitment is with that many people now setting up in, in, in and around the town centre. So, um, you know, the stats for themselves say that, that the work that's happening in and around the town centre is attracting new business. So uh, it was just to, to put that stat out there. OK, Chris, you want to come back? Yeah, is it, I, 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 very briefly on this, because there is other questions I'd like to ask. Um, one of the ideas of uh, when we when we put the, the Kim 7172, the old Oceana Kim in front of council was the fact of lack of office space. And um, we're now saying that there's going to be office space on the King's Way, or sorry, on Princess Way, uh, and also in, 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 in the Albert Hall. Um, which again is great. Don't get me wrong for one up. All these developments are are fine, and all the developments about the uh, about you know concert venues etc. But at the end of the day, we have a very limited um, audience, and we have a very limited amount of people that use office space. The only, to the best of my knowledge, there's only two places in the UK where office accommodation is being uh, built and without substantial investment by um, by the um, local authority and that is London and Manchester um, and in London what they're doing is they are like we've done with the Albert Hall and what they're doing with um, with the um, Palace Theatre they repurposing buildings and I understand um, but there's no one else doing it there is a, a big office development that has gone up in Cardiff and you are, you are right Swansea's a bit more attractive now because it's quite a bit cheaper than in Cardiff and if we can get the the uh, linkages right uh, for uh, accommodation because Swansea is becoming a dormitory area for various other places. Um, but going back to the city centre and, and the shopping, that you are right, a lot of the out of town shopping has destroyed the city, not just for in um, internationally, but you've also got in on Carmarthen Road, you have the development around Tesco's. Uh, on both sides of the road there, and you've also got the development, uh, the, the enterprise zone. And let's be blunt about it, our city centre stretches from the bay up to the M4, because all of that area there is now has now got retail in it, and it's very successful, and it's got free car parking, which has upset the city centre. Um, going off that, though, going on to your... Um, you, you did say you are going to be brief, Chris. I, I, sorry about that. Um, but going on to the the report proper, uh, uh, Rob, if I can ask a, a very very simple question, and that is around about the the final item on the uh, on your report, not the final item, the Swansea Bay uh, on and West Wales Metro program. I hate to say that word Metro because you probably blame me for it, um, <laughs> but um, th this this is a very ambitious program and one which I. I think is absolutely superb and one which actually would generate a considerable amount of um, a considerable amount of wealth for the city because it would make us more connected. What is the outline and what and what is the time scale for that, please? Yeah, um, Chair, if I could do the just clear up the first bit, uh, just so we finish on the city centre. Just just one last thing on that. I think um, the one thing we which I do disagree with Chris on, um, you know, is that we should never uh, see ourselves as small or insignificant or not being able to be more successful than we currently are. I'm and I think... Never said that. No, no, I no, but, but, I, but I think it, it's in terms of context about how we approach the problems that are before us. I, I'm very much a believer in, you know, making sure that we give people the opportunity to base themselves here in Swansea. We make the conditions as attractive as possible for people to choose to work in Swansea and base their business in Swansea. What we've found over a number of years is that whilst it's been great for businesses to set up here and, and to, to establish themselves, when they get to a certain size, there isn't the office accommodation in the city centre to keep them here. And then they're faced to, to either look outside of the city centre, which adds to the out of town problem, or to move out of county, which is even worse. So, uh, you know, I think, I take the point that Chris makes in terms of cities like London, where there may be an over provision of office space, that might be an issue, but we've, we're fixing a different problem here. And actually what COVID has taught us is 
people are people can work from any part of of the world effectively so we've got a brilliant as we said previously we've got a brilliant beautiful natural environment here we've got a great uh, you know quality of life actually we've got a very attractive offer to bring companies to swansea and to base themselves here but we've got to create the the locations for them to do that and i think we've got a really really good opportunity to do that in the next few years as part of the the next phase of developments on the transport uh, side of stuff Yes, we had an update from Transport for Wales uh, last week. Um, the uh, work on the Metro is proceeding really well. Um, they are now getting to the stage where they're mapping out the capital costs of doing each part of the line and what each of the, the new stations would cost in terms of the infrastructure works. Um, they've done quite a bit of work in terms of looking at how the bus services uh, would connect in with the rail services and the active travel. Um, we're looking at... Uh, Transport of Wales are looking at the next generation of public uh, vehicles, how we can help um, move towards hydrogen and electric vehicles. So again, looking at um, hydrogen or electric buses uh, and hydrogen uh, trains or, or light rail on the network there. And then all of the uh, necessary infrastructure to make that work in terms of um, things like um, through ticket in and single ticket in so that people can get on and off various forms of transport so they're not just time to run together which is what they should be but also that you only need to buy one ticket to get through various modes of transport now my understanding is that there are, there are announcements due shortly uh, and i do expect swansea to play a leading uh, part in terms of trialing the, the new bus services and obviously uh, you know working with our regional partners to deliver that metro i think you know it is essential that we get the Southwest Wales Metro underway. And, and I would expect within the next couple of years, work to have started on creating the, the physical infrastructure for the rail network. And we may see buses running before then, if that can be uh, agreed with Welsh Government and the, and the operators. Will, will the lead on this be taken by the new joint committee, Rob? Certainly under the uh, corporate joint committees, uh, a, a transport stream has been established. As you'll be aware, since the switch arrangements were done away within their formal uh, um, status, we have continued to operate uh, essentially a shadow switch arrangement yeah. in terms of collaborating between the various authorities and, and bodies. Uh, but under the uh, corporate joint committees, there is going to be a transport uh, committee uh, and a transport body that will take forward not just the, the collaboration on existing transport between the, the partners, but also working uh, around the the metro what we don't yet know is in terms of where, when the funding obviously uh, subject to it being agreed is released um, whether that will be something that's managed um, via the CJCs or through another mechanism but we will work through that at the moment I I don't know whether Martin wants the same thing because I know Martin's been uh, heavily involved in in drawing together the arrangements for the CJCs Martin um, just to add leader the uh, and chair the uh, we just waited for confirmation from Welsh government regarding the confirmed timeline as to when they will be looking for the first iteration of the regional transport plan. We understand it's around about the middle of 2023 and we think there's a circa 12 month period to develop that regional transport plan. So uh, we're working with the CJC to establish that work programme and to appropriately resource it for uh, the next financial year. Be happy to share, <coughs> excuse me, be happy to share the details of that as it becomes further, as more details become further available in due course. Okay, thank you, Martin. Right, just going back to the city centre, then Mike White on on Wine Street. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Leader. Yeah, my question <laughs> then to the 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 reimagining of Wine Street. Um, uh, as I say, uh, obviously we know that obviously the, the progress of a uh, three million pound investment in the Wine Street to improve the the, the public realm there. And, and aiming to expand the appeal of the area, and so it'd be obviously for 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 people, and also for it be for a uh, safer, more accessible, and attractive environment. What feedback have we had from the businesses on this scheme, and has it generated interest generated interest from new businesses to Wine Street, and obviously by supporting them with COVID. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, in terms of of Wine Street itself, just to, just to be clear, the three million pound investment also includes a significant chunk of money uh, for security measures at each end of Wine Street. Because again, what we wanted to do was to create a safe environment where people could be protected um, should a vehicle um, come uh, into that area. So uh, a large chunk of that money has been spent on on security measures to keep people safe whilst they're enjoying wine street so that that's important to note but also you know the, the more visible parts of, of what people can see in terms of you know creating an environment which um, we would hope is uh, is something that everybody can enjoy not just those who who seek to go into the to the late hours uh, you know it includes new furniture new lighting the opportunity for businesses to come out on that street and, and use that space much more uh, effectively to expand their business which has been hugely important for our hospitality businesses during covid where they faced restrictions on the numbers of people they can have inside so it's really important but also people enjoy sitting out uh, for, for lots of the year uh, you know even in the cold of winter in swansea you'll still see people sitting outside cafes and using the the public spaces and i think that's great and uh, you know what we are trying to do as 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 an authority and administration has been to provide that that uh, environment and make it really safe and nice for people to be in and also offer it to businesses uh, free of charge which is what we've been doing obviously for for the last few years i think uh, looking to the future uh, mike obviously um, we'll be looking at the connections through the lanes into wine street and and doing some some neat stuff to to do some some great stuff to, to turn those lanes into really uh, good cultural spaces as well and, and good connections because it's about place making. Um, we also obviously have said in terms of the operation of Wine Street, we want to work with the businesses and with local performers because there there is the um, performance spaces that are being created in, in Wine Street because again it's part of the concept is to get local bands and, and performers playing in the outside spaces in Wine Street. So it becomes, actually the outside space becomes used. It's not just something you walk through or use while you're going from one venue to another. It's it's something about the outside space becoming a, a destination in itself and people being able to enjoy bands and acts out there. And of course it links to the plans that we have to reinstate, uh, you know, Castle Square Gardens. And we'll be, we'll be sharing the um, the detail on, on Castle Square Gardens in the next few days, and it's it's a continuation of that. What I would say in terms of businesses, I think they've been really positive about the changes because they've we've worked with them in terms of the changes. And, and whilst there have been, uh, as you would expect, different views in terms of placement of furniture and, and some of the ways in which the street is, is designed, I think it's a huge improvement over what was there. And I think will be great for the businesses who will want to make sure that when people come and visit the arena, they take the opportunity perhaps to, to stay over a couple of nights, enjoy wine streets, uh, you know, do lots of other things, enjoy the bay because we've got a wonderful beach just across the road and take uh, take the opportunity to, to spend more time in Swansea. And, and wine street is an important part of that because it's a really important part of our economy, the nighttime economy. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think when people see the finished article and we get to the slightly warmer weather, we don't have restrictions. Uh, I think people will see uh, it's going to be a really brilliant uh, place to enjoy uh, in the city centre. OK. OK, then uh, Peter Jones on the city deal. Uh, thank you, Chair. Air quality and uh, the problem of air pollution. Um, we know that there are estimates suggesting that upwards of 40,000 deaths occur in the United Kingdom each year as a consequence of poor air quality and air pollution. And of course, we also know that a major contributor to poor air quality uh, has been, will continue to be uh, motor transport along our roads and so forth. So I was very pleased, very pleased to read in the report that we have installed 70 air quality monitoring sensors uh, across Swansea. Um, I mean, this is very good news indeed, I think, in terms of trying to understand the nature and the levels of air pollution. I know that my own performance panel, Natural Environment Performance Panel, has repeatedly looked at this issue, uh, and we recognise it as one of serious health concern to people in Swansea uh, and beyond. So what I'm wondering now in terms of a question is how will we use the information that we glean from these sensors uh, in terms of policy going forward. I mean, I'm presuming it's going to influence future transport planning. Uh, it obviously underpins the kind of thinking behind the, the Metro proposal. 
and alternatives to fossil fuel uh, based transport. But I'm just wondering, how do we anticipate using the information that clearly we will get from these sensors? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, th th thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, it, it will help to inform all of those things. I think we, we, it'll be great to have, uh, as you say, a, a much wider network of those devices able to give us a better picture of air quality uh, across the city and where uh, we need interventions or we need to have uh, a difference in, uh, of approach, we can do that. Just to say, look, we, we use the information from the Harvard Air Quality Monitoring um, to inform what we did. And, and, it, and, you know, we can track the fact that the nitrogen dioxide levels have reduced uh, by approximately 30% in that area since 2016. Um, now, when we're able to get the detailed data from these new devices, you know, it'll help in terms of where the development goes, the, you know, the green infrastructure that we're creating throughout the city centre. It helps us to, to target mm. some of that, but also then making sure that, as you say, we make the right choices in terms of transport, not just, you know, how we do traffic flows, but, uh, you know, the, the impact that things like hydrogen buses or light rail will have are in terms of getting, we hope, greater number of people through the city centre, but in a much more healthy and less environmentally impactful way. So, um, you know, all of those things. And I, I think it's a, a really important that we are able to call on that data as we make those decisions in future years. That's great. Thank you, Rob. I, th I think um, a number of other cities have done this where the information is public, publicly accessible on a web page or something. Are we planning to do something like that, whereby someone could go onto a web page and see what the current situation is or, and historical trends? Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll go back and check for sure, Peter, but I, I think that absolutely the, um, the intention would be that people can access the data that we collect and they'll be able to see that in terms of, uh, you know, the the information, because I, I know there are apps that you can get at the moment which, yeah. which draw from those sources and, and can give you information uh, in that way. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect this information to remain, uh, you know, behind closed doors. It, it's something that should be publicly available. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, OK, Terry Helligan. You're muted. Uh, since I put the question in, I've received some information um, regarding um, the council house investment um, regarding the Tedna One Emirates estate. Um, I would like to know: Is the steering group being set up um, regarding the master plan? Um, I was told last week there was, and then this week I was told there isn't. So. I was wondering if uh, anybody could give me some information on that. Um, the other thing, uh, Rob, you mentioned the hotels. I'm adding this. I didn't put this to the pre-meeting. I'm sorry. Um, when Swans in the Premiership, a lot of the hotels was overbooking. And when fans were turning up, were booked in advance, they was told there was no room. What they did then was go on um, the social media and put it all around the country. Be careful when you go to Swansea because you can book your hotel, but when you get there, um, you find you haven't got a place to... I actually have some West Ham supporters, um, and I directed them up to the Uplands. There's a little guest house up there where they found accommodation, and they, they appreciated that, although I'm a Man United supporter. But the fact is, we've got to have these people in place as well. When they're coming down to the arena, very important that if people are booking hotels, that when they turn up after they've been to the show, a very good show, I hope, that they are accommodated. I also raised about two years ago help for local musicians, bands, duos, soloists, because if you're going to be doing something like that in Wine Street, it'd be nice to fetch our local people um, on board. That's yeah. yeah. Terry, if I take the hotel question, and I, I can see Andrew's got her hand up, so she'll maybe be able to oh, answer the, uh, the Tedna Place uh, question. Look, uh, I absolutely agree with you. I, I'd not heard the um, the the um, point that you made about uh, bookings being cancelled, and I would hope that no hotels do that. Now there may have been some disruption during COVID, where restrictions have meant that 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 has occurred, and and we do know that the government have acquired hotels uh, in many locations during COVID to help with things like um, making sure that homeless people are housed and safe during the pandemic and during certain waves. So there will have been some disruption. So you, you, that may well have played a part, Terry, but um, I would expect um, that, you know, when people come to Swansea, that they got a choice of many uh, good hotels. As you know, we're, we're proposing to, to work with a partner to build a hotel 
uh, right next to the arena and we hope to be able to give further details on that in due course uh, and we are aware of other hotel interest uh, and we're talking to a number of potential developers at the moment who are interested in bringing further hotels to the city centre and I'm sure those will be in the public domain in due course. Um, so there, there should be a great choice of hotel rooms for people who will be able to come and have a wonderful weekend in uh, in Swansea, Terry. And we won't hold it against you being a Manu supporter. <laughs> Before I bring Andrea in, Rob, you know there's a lot of speculation on social media about the Dragon Hotel. Um, is that likely to be reopening soon? Do you, do you have any information on that at all? Yeah, so again, I, I've been quite clear on the misinformation that was, yeah. was put out there by certain groups. Um, clearly, there'd been a breakdown in communications. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd said uh, that there, we'd had assurance from the Home Office that that location would not be used for the, the housing of refugees or asylum seekers. And that's not because we, we won't. Uh, support or, or didn't want to to look after asylum seekers and, and others in Swansea and, and certainly refugees. Um, but the, putting them in hotels is not the best uh, option for those uh, people who will be fleeing conflict or could could have significant uh, needs when, when they arrive in the UK. So we, we have a much better programme of uh, looking after people in communities where all of the services that they may need are available to them and obviously you know, for things like schools where they may need language services those are available to them so it, it's about doing it in the right way i think um given that the home office were um looking at a number of options i think it became a position that where it perhaps got overtaken by events but certainly the home office themselves have come out uh, and confirmed that is not their intention and that they will not be uh, placing refugees or asylum seekers in the, the Dragon Hotel now or in the future. Uh, I think what now needs to happen is for the owners of, of the Dragon Hotel to decide the appropriate time at which they can reopen to the public, um, given obviously they they had um, made, made uh, decisions uh, during the pandemic, which they, they'll now need to make uh, their own business decisions on. So, you know, uh, I, I would hope that the Dragon can reopen to the public in due course. OK, thanks for that, Rob. Andrea, do you want to come back on the Tudno place and the uh, uh, issue? Yes, uh, happy to come in on the Tudno and Emrys um, question and, and thank you to Councillor Hennigan. Uh, I know that this is a hot topic in the wards at the moment. Um, just to give a bit of reassurance and just to advise where we are and how we've got to where we are. Um, prior to the pandemic, we did carry out actually a number of consultation events, drop-in sessions, uh, walked the ward as it were with, with tenants and residents uh, and they fed in to the early consultation about the master planning of the site. Unfortunately, COVID prevented us from further engagement, but we did engage Powell Dobson, who have drawn together a sort of high level master plan. Uh, the, the plan is now that this spring 2022, we intend to engage with the ward members. Uh, and as soon as the pandemic will allow, we will give further consultation to the tenants and the residents, because I'm keen that we don't do things to the site without their voice. It's important that the tenants' voice feeds into any plans that we do. But whatever is decided in the final decisions, it will be to improve the site for the benefit of the tenants and the residents living there. And, and I know officers are equally frustrated, as I know tenants and residents are, that we haven't been able to move this on due to COVID. But it's our intention that as soon as we possibly can, we'll be reinvigorating that engagement, getting back out into the community and agreeing a final plan so that we can then get on with it. So my, my, my thanks to Councillor Hennigan and the ward members for their patience. And my thanks to the tenants and the residents for their patience, but it's been a difficult time to carry out any meaningful engagement because we haven't been able to have face to face meetings, but it is fully our intention to improve that site for the benefit of the tenants and the residents living there. Uh, and I know officers are just as keen as me to get this moving. Thanks, Let me Andrea. Just come back on that, Pete, just yeah, for sure. information for the, the cabinet member. Um, I've already uh, provided um, the estate and tenants and residents with a blank model constitution and a blank mo model constitution guidelines um, because they will be setting up a group shortly. Um, I know, and I've also given Alison, is it Alison Winter, the tenant participation officer's telephone number, so she can, if, if they want, she can come in and help as well. 
Yeah, sorry, Chair, if I can come back in on that. We are aware that there's a, a tenants group being formed uh, with a spokesperson. We're more than happy to engage with that group and with the spokesperson to move things forward. So I'm um, very happy to to link with them. And as I say, we're just keen to, to get work started. OK, okay. thanks, everyone. Thank you. OK, any more questions for Rob? No. OK, can I thank you, Rob and, and Andrea and the officers for the session? Thank you very much indeed. It'd be very useful. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate thank the you. invite. Thanks, Cheers. everyone. Thank you, okay. Chair. OK, going to move on to item now, nine now, which is the Scrutiny Performance Panel Progress Report. And Lyndon Jones has been waiting very patiently to talk about education. Are you going to introduce this, Lyndon, or are we going to take it as read? He's uh, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, uh, you can certainly, uh, you know, t take it as read, but I'll just add one or two things. One uh, ongoing uh, th things that, that is, number one, the city deal. We're always very concerned uh, uh, to make sure that we've got the right skills in schools uh, so that local people can get jobs locally and they don't have to move out of Swansea. So that is something that's always on our minds and on our agenda. Also, children are, on, are, are getting free school meals that they uh, sometimes underperform and we want to make sure and we that is again high in our agenda and finally really to thank the teachers and staff throughout Swansea uh, over the uh, during the pandemic they have been learning on the hoof they've done a tremendous job so the teachers and staff and also Helen Morgan Reese and her team as well uh, because a lot of us including myself have been in touch with them about local issues uh, and, and, and they've been really helpful. Uh, but th th those are the three things I'd like to add. Thank you, Liz. And I think we we certainly all um, reflect the thanks to the teachers and the head teachers and, and the support staff in the schools. Um, they've done a fantastic job during the pandemic. And I think, you know, they very much thank them for that. Anybody got any questions or points they want to raise on this report? No. OK, thank you, Lyndon, for that. And uh, yeah. the committee will note the um, the contents of, of the work you're doing on, on that panel. Uh, membership of scrutiny panels of working groups. There's no changes to that. Um, so that takes us to the scrutiny work programme. The next meeting is on the 15th of February and it's the crime and disorder scrutiny session. So we'll hopefully have the police leads as well as the council leads and the community safety partnership at that meeting. Um, just to say that um, I think I raised in a previous meeting about a possible scrutiny on um, ch charging electric um, vehicles at home following queries. I think that's going to wait until after the election now before we come back onto that. Um, a, a draft strategy is being drawn up on that. So when that strategy is available to consultation, we will certainly look at, 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 that, at that, that during the consultation, I think, and feed into it, which would be quite useful. Um, and so that, that's that one. Anybody got anything you want to say on the work programme at all? No? OK, so we've got scrutiny letters for noting and the time and oh, date and time for so date and time for upcoming scrutiny panel meetings also for noting as well. Um, unless anyone has anything else to raise, I think that's it. Can I thank Mr. you all Steve, for you? Well done. It's one minute past six. Well we did said. our best, Terry. We did our best. Can I thank you all for your for your attendance and for participating in a very useful meeting? I'm sorry it took so long, but I think it was worth it. Thank yeah. you very much indeed, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.